this movie kind of think really started in December of 2008, and that's when The Last Truck rolled off that plant, and you made a short film about it called The Last Truck. How did that film lead to this film, and did you think you were done with the story when you made The Last Truck? Totally done. We thought we'd never go back into that factory. That film is an HBO film. It came out in 2009, and we were living our lives, but in 20, late 2014, the chairman bought the plant, and in early 2015, we got a call saying, um, you know what's going on down at the old GM plant? We had read the paper. Yeah, it's big, big news. But we weren't thinking we would make a film. We, you know, GM never let us into the GM plants. We, we did all kinds of different things to get cameras in that plant, but we weren't, tr we weren't sort of gunning to get into this plant. And then the, some of the folks who had wooed Fuyao to come to Dayton called us because we know them, and they said, you know, we started talking. Someone's got to document this. It's going to be big. It's going to be historic. How about you guys? And they, the, company, the original plan was that the company would hire us to make a, like a film, which we don't do. The company meaning Fuyao. Fuyao. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> we, so we said, you know, we'll, we're interested. It does sound really like a big story, an important, relevant story. But we'll do it if, it, if if it's our film, if we own it, if we have editorial control, you don't give us any money, and yet you give us real access. And the chairman thought about it and said yes. Thought about it and said yes. Because I think without Chairman Chow's participation, you have no movie. When you are having conversations with him, and obviously he gives you tremendous access, what were his concerns and... Did he let you do what you wanted to do outside of filming the anti-union meeting? The, I mean, I think in the early days, the, the thought of how this would go was so much like a smooth road that it was easy to say yes. It was easy to sort of welcome us in because it's all these sort of wonderful, frothy kind of cultural intersections happening. And so in the early days, I mean, the chairman was like, yeah, look, this is my story. This is what I'm trying to do and you know, go for it. The reality is when you make a documentary that if you show up day after day after day, and we live 25 minutes from that plant, we went there hundreds of times. We have 1,200 hours of footage that this amazing oh, woman- We'll get to what Lindsay went through This amazing woman put minute. together. <laughs> but um, we were there so often that we just became normalized. And as things got hard, I mean, I'm sure they talked about, should we kick these filmmakers out? But it was never like a hot topic. We were told there was a few meetings here and there we weren't allowed to film, uh, but plenty of stuff we were. And it, it just, you know, the slowly boiled frog doesn't notice it's boiling. Like <laughs> we, we were just always there. And then, so yeah, we, yeah. Julie, I want to ask you what that means logistically as a producer, because as a documentary, you're not only telling a story, but you're casting it with characters and people. And when you're shooting a lot of footage, you're also trying to figure out who the people are who are going to help you tell that story. And it obviously takes a while, but how does the film evolve in terms of the people who are going to lead us through this tale? And how did you end up settling on the people that you picked, including people who don't speak English? Yeah. I mean, I really, that's Steve and Julia as the, as the co-directors here who had, you know, been in the plant. Some of the people were in the last truck, like Bobby Allen. And um, so they were, they came back for the, the second film. Um, but you all were in there day in, day out, and really, you know, knew who was emerging as your main characters. Wong, I think, is an incredible character in the film, and Rob Hare and Jill LaMantia. I mean, really, I think, you know, they emerged over time with, you know, filming in there day in, day out. Lindsay, documentary filmmakers can shoot 300 hours, 400 hours. This is 1,200 hours shot over what time period? Three years. Three years. At what point do you come onto the project and how do you start to figure out what that story is? Because you could make 1,200 different films. Um. <clears throat> there's so there's like 1200 different ways I can answer that <laughs> answer that question um, uh, yeah I've never seen so much footage it was a lot uh, you know it's okay I forgive you um, no I, I think it's I'm really I tend to be attracted to these types of projects where a director and in this case directors are so immersed in the story so dedicated to following 
the action on the ground for years at a time. And I don't know if I'm just a glutton for punishment or what, but like I just like that kind of filmmaking because it yields the most incredible scenes. And it's like the, the downside is you have to really wade through all that material and dig for the stuff that shines. And, um, you know, it's a discovery process on any documentary film as you're working through all that raw footage. And on this one, it was particularly so um, because a lot of the footage hadn't been translated when we started editing. And so, you know, it was clear what some of the big scenes were in English, but we didn't have, I didn't have like a Chinese co-producer sitting with me at all times. I did sometimes, but there was a lot of sort of watching the verite material, looking at the body language, trying to figure out if something was happening that seemed worth <laughs> getting, you know, translated. And honestly, it was sort of like, seems like there's something funny happening here or something, you know, tense happening here. And you can see that even if you don't speak the language. And so it was a, you know, I had an enormous post-production team. I did not do this alone. I had incredible assistants, translators, co-producers. And we just set up a system in which we kind of identified what we wanted to have translated. And then we were able to get that back in, caption it, and really watch it you know, as a verite scene translated. And that when that happened, I think the story really blew up for all of us. We realized this was much bigger, you know, than, I mean, you, right? Yeah. I mean, then we had, I mean, we knew it was a big story, but when you get to the translations back, it's sort of, But it's early on, early yeah. on, Lindsay gave us a challenge. She's, she said, like, let's, what if we say we're going to build the architecture of the film on the verite scenes because we had also done a zillion interviews right. on camera interviews beautifully lit i worked my ass off to light <laughs> these beautiful frames but you know verite has a magic to it right. if if it's true and 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 that was a great instinct that you had because ultimately we had the goods we had the material in the verite and and that's the foundation of the film chad i wonder if that same idea transfers to what you're doing scoring to not make the obvious more obvious, to make sure that the story tells itself. But also, how do you see your role in terms of making a thematic score to tie all these stories together? Well, the wonderful thing is, by the time I saw anything, Lindsay had already cut most of it. <laughs> so it was already in a beautiful state by the time I was brought on. Um, I would say the primary thing I tried to contribute to this film was taking the things that the characters are teaching us, um, especially Wong, he was someone that I was really drawn to. This friendship This is the furnace worker. Yeah, the friendship between Wong and Rob mm -hmm. is just this beautiful like brotherly love they have for each other. Even though they hardly understand each other, there's something deeper connecting them. And musically, I tried to, a, a lot of the score has duets. There's mm -hmm. these two things going on. We have two countries that are coming together. And in the case of Robin Wong, it's just this two friends. And so like the closing sequence, it's this big duet between two, two things and they're harmonizing and trying to add hope to, to uh, what could be a, a very bleak outlook on this film. But Steve, something happens in the film where there are workers from, American workers who go to China and their eyes are open for better and for worse. And I'm wondering, as a filmmaker, when you go along with them, does it change your understanding of the movie you're making and of the dynamic between the two countries? Completely. De it deepened it dramatically for us. W what Wong was missing, we only knew in the abstract until we went to China. You know, he's here stuck in Ohio, and he's missing his, his culture, his food, his family. Okay, so we all, I can say those words, but that they don't have impact. When we went to China, it was just this immersion into the, this deeply rich, beautiful, overwhelmingly um, alive culture, community, world. The intensity of it, uh, I fell in love with. I mean, we didn't, and I didn't anticipate that. We were going to go, we were in a third tier, what they call a third tier city. It's like um, the Dayton, Ohio of China. It's not like Chicago or Cleveland or New York or LA. It's, it's, and yet, even in that quote unquote third tier city, the streets were so um, vibrant and the people were so warm and connected. 
and you, I just really felt like, okay, this is what he's missing. This is what all these these folks who who ended up in Ohio from China are missing. And so I, you know, in terms of, I mean, one of the goals with the films was trying to build empathy for people who maybe don't talk to each other or don't get each other, and going to China deepened that in a huge way. Steve, Julie, Lindsay, Chad, thank you for bringing us your film.